Thank you very much, Antonis, uh, for, for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to do uh, another tutorial. Um, so I was asked not to share a screen first, but uh, uh, now I can probably start. Um, so uh, this is the title of my tutorial. And I was also asked to say a few things about myself. So uh, here's a slide about myself. So I got my bachelor degree from China in Shandong University. I got my first master degree in phonetics from Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in China. And I got my PhD from University of Connecticut and that was in linguistics. And then I did my postdoc at MIT and did uh, assistant professor at Northwestern University. And then uh, starting from 2004, I was at the UCL. I've gone through lecturer, reader, and professor. And uh, so in terms of my research over the years, um, I did my work on PhD for uh, on tone, and that led to the target approximation model. And then I extended the tone work to intonation, which led to the Penta model. And then I also extended my tone work to segmental co-articulation, which led to the synchronization model of the syllable, which was first published in, in, in its first version in 2006. And then last year, I uh, put it on the uh, preprint platform. And in addition, I also did some work on emotional prosody which led to the bioinformational dimension theory of emotion, uh, emotional prosody. Currently, I have a grant uh, funded by Lieberhume, and that is on high quality simulation of early vocal learning using an articulatory, articulatory synthesizer trained by acoustics to simulate how a child may learn to speak. Uh, but today's topic is very narrow. So, uh, I'm going to talk about timing only. And in fact, only one aspect of timing. So speech happens in time. So when we speak, everything comes in a string. So time dimension is already used to arrange units in sequence. But besides temporal orders, there are two other aspects of timing that are highly relevant. The first is temporal alignment. And the second is duration. But today I'm focusing only on duration because temporal alignment is a whole different uh, thing. So uh, that will be done in some other time. But as you will see, duration is not trivial. There are already two opposing views on the timing in speech. Um, they're not that well known, but for people who look at timing uh, in, in focus, and they would know these opposing views. The first one was proposed by Carol Fowler in 1980. Uh, according to her, segmental timing is intrinsic to the articulation plan of segments. Such intrinsic timing is the basis of understanding co-articulation. So her concern about her proposal is about co-articulation. And then just last year, Turk and Shadok Hafnagel um, wrote a paper in Frontiers in Psychology, and they proposed that many aspects of timing in speech is due to phonology extrinsic timing. So this intrinsic timing is something that uh, Fowler said against, saying that everything should be understood from the intrinsic, that is the articulation aspect. But according to Turk and Shadok, half day ago, surface duration requirements are represented during speech production. My take on timing is similar to actually the, the two opposing views, but in my system, they're both there. They're, they are two aspects of timing. Uh, and this is consistent with my articulatory functional perspective on speech in general. So speech is articulated and articulation takes time. 
So there must be something intrinsic, intrinsic or obligatory. And also speech conveys information. Now the question is, is the timing dimension itself used to encode information? And as you will see, it certainly does. So at, at least theoretically, there are two possibilities. So timing properties are either obligatory or informational. And the obligatory timing is that is obligated by articulation. And this corresponds to the idea of intrinsic timing. And information timing is for encoding communicative meanings. And that corresponds to extrinsic timing, meaning that whatever the articulation is require you to do in terms of timing, there is something extra that is imposed on the, onto the articulation process. So both are needed and observed timing patterns result from the interaction of the two, rather than just only intrinsic or only extrinsic. Okay, so then focusing on duration, just one aspect of timing without worrying about the relative timing uh, of different units, but only duration. A clear view of duration is key to understanding many unresolved issues about speech. And these are not trivial issues. They're, these are huge issues, in fact. Uh, the first one is the economy of effort or maximum rate of information. And the latter is a new proposal that we published in 2000, 2000. Yeah, I think it's the same issue of the uh, Turk and Shaktaf Shadok Havnagel paper, 2020. And second thing is, this is just one thing, but it has many names, phrasing, grouping, demarcation, boundary marking, and so on. And the third thing is the famous well-known rhythm class hypothesis. And finally, there's the issue of this. This is the eternal issue of stress. That is stress that is not lexical. And as you will see that the duration, uh, if you look at duration intensely, these all come into the picture. So I'll start, uh, spend at least half of the time on obligatory timing, what we can learn from looking at obligatory timing. So this is more appropriately time pressure obligated by articulation. And in, as you will see, it is not trivial, as it is relevant for one of the fundamental issues about human speech. That is, when we speak, when, when I do this, what is the most precious resource of speech? And that brings us to this almost widely accepted notion of economy of effort. That is, we are lazy. We try to save effort while we speak. And this is elaborated into a big theory known as the hyper and hypo articulation theory or H and H theory proposed by Lindblom, I think in his well-known paper, um, 1990. According to him, unconstrained, a motor system tends to default to a low cost form of behavior. So low cost is a very important factor in his thinking. And considered as one of the fundamental principles underlying many speech phenomena, especially in the form of hyper and hypo articulation. And this economy of effort is, in fact, not just about speech. It's about motor movements, about things we do in general. So that is why it is so popular. So the hyper articulation is to guarantee categorical contrasts in production. When you do that, you try to make full or exaggerated articulation, which makes full sense, right? It makes very good sense. So that is why it's so uh, ap appealing, so widely accepted. And in hyper articulation, a default low cost 
economical form of behavior. And when you default to that, you try to save energy, and that would lead to undershoot. So that is the idea. In other words, a major tug of war in speech articulation is between phonetic contrast and energy saving. So on the one hand, you want to make as clear a phonetic contrast as possible. On the other hand, you have a great need to save energy. So this is well known and is widely accepted. But there are theories about that. The first one is, is it really the case that in normal speech, the production system is rarely driven to its limits, according to Lindblom? So to test that, we need to find out if speakers indeed rarely approach their speed limit of articulation. And that is not hard to test, as you will see. And the second question is, is it the case that articulatory effort is the key control of clarity of speech? That is, if you want to say something clearly, do you use articulatory effort to make sure you do that? And that is often assumed, but I'm posing that as a question. And to test that, we can look at one puzzle that's been floating around for many years. That is what I call the, the stress stiffness enigma. More specifically, when people do, do measurements, they find greater stress is related to lower stiffness, which doesn't make sense, right? Which goes the opposite to what is predicted by the H and H theory. Okay, so to look at the first uh, question, what we did, and that was a long time ago, um, is to look at first how quickly pe people can change pitch. And in that study, when, the way we did it is to force people to imitate a sequence of tone changes as fast as possible. So uh, we start with a tone that they can simulate, they can uh, imitate, uh, and this is uh, okay. So this is more normal rate, and this is fast rate. So fast that people cannot really imitate, but we just force them to do as much as possible. And uh, the other way around. Uh, so the way they did it is to simply say uh, uh, as much as possible, and then we measured. We took all kinds of measurements. And to, long, to make a long story short, we came up, uh, came up with uh, equations that can predict, that can summarize how fast they can change pitch. So th these are two of them in terms of time, rise time needed to uh, make a particular uh, change in pitch. So here D stands for the level of change or the amplitude of change you need to make in terms of semitones. So that's the only variable in the equation. Uh, and then there is a constant term. So this is for the time you need to make a transition of this size in terms of milliseconds. So this is in milliseconds. And this is to make a rise and this is to make fall. They are slightly different. So they have two different equations. Now, if we apply to if we apply this, these equations, we can see very interesting pictures. Um, so here's, okay, so somebody's, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, F0 contours that I obtained in my 1997 study. So these are the contours recorded from real speech. Uh, and then these, they look, they look smooth because they're averaged uh, across many tokens. So now we apply the equations to this contour. So in this time, I look at this particular one, a low tone followed by a high tone. So after the low tone, the high tone has to go up, right, to make a transition. And then we measured the 
distance that ha speakers traveled on average, and that's about six semitones. And we plug that six semitone into the D. And based on the equation, we got 142 milliseconds. And if you then look at the duration obtained from that study, you can see that the duration of the syllable is 196 milliseconds, which means just to make this pitch rise, you need to take up more than half of the syllable duration. So this would be the so-called intrinsic duration or the obligatory timing, because you cannot avoid that. Now, this turns out to be the easy case, because you only need to want, make one change during one syllable. But in many cases, you have to make two movements. That is when a tone is a dynamic tone. So for, for example, in Mandarin, if you have a falling tone, then after the low tone, you have to go up first and then go down. So to calculate the minimum amount of time you need to make it the two changes, you need to add the two up. So this part is for the rising part, and this part is for the falling part. And when you add the two together, you get 265 milliseconds, which is much longer than the duration of the syllable itself. So, which means that uh, basically, if you have to complete the two movements, it's impossible. So speakers are doing the impossible. Of course, they cannot do the impossible. What they did is that uh, the measurement we took from that speed limit study was actually done from measuring from the uh, minimum here and then the minimum here, which are not included in this plot. And that is the only way they could do it. So what they suggest is that in trying to produce a falling tone after low tone, they have to, uh, they have to reach their maximum speed. And even after doing that, they have to undershoot the target. That is, given this falling tone, given the fact that after this high tone, which already ends high, the falling tone goes a little bit higher, which means that this is the ideal height for the falling tone. And in this case, speakers certainly did not achieve it. So there's an undershoot, although this undershoot is perfectly OK for perception, but at least they didn't reach the maximum. Now, then in the same study, we actually compared the maximum speed that we measured from the arbitrary study to real speed that we observed in speech. And the real speed was from my paper in 1999. That's normal speech, fluent but normal. What we found was that the maximum speed of pitch change is indeed reached in cases where the tones are dynamic, like rising tone and falling tone. So you can see this is in terms of rise speed, but the numbers match, meaning that for the rising tone and the falling tone, yeah, rising part and falling part, speakers have to reach the maximum speed of pitch change, meaning, they're th meaning that they're at their limits. And we did a further study, which is not, not related to the early ones, uh, with one of my students, one of the students at uh, UCL. And we were looking at cases like uh, rising, 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 rising tone. Ling, 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 yo, me, yo. Uh, and that's normal speed. And then slow speed is this. And then ling, 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 yo, me, yo. That's the fast speed. So at fast speed, they had to flatten the pitch because they have to go too fast and because they have to make two movements. And again, in this study also established that, I'm not sure if it's on this slide. Yeah, it's not on this slide. The, the green curves, which is from the normal speed, based on our calculation, the normal speed already reached the maximum speed, not to mention the fast. So in normal production, like ling, 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 yomio, they are already going as fast as possible. Okay, so that's about pitch change. And then after that, 
we did a study on the segmental articulation to see if it is also the case that in segmental articulation, people would reach their maximum speed. So what we did is to have one condition where we have nonsense syllables like wah, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And in another condition, we have real sentences. And these sequence of syllables, this uh, CVC syllables are embedded in these sentences. And speakers just spoke them normally, one at fast speed and then one at normal speed, only two speed. So we wanted to see whether the maximum speed that we forced them to do would uh, match their regular speed. So what we did is something like this. So we, uh, I recorded myself as the target speaker, um, like this. Wah, 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 wah. Right. And then I, we speed it up with the computer. Wah, 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 wah. Okay. You can hear it, but no speaker could actually do that. But we force them to go in that direction anyway, and to see how fast they can go. But then that, that condition was only used as a reference. So here are some of the results. Um, in these plots, what you see is on the x-axis, movement duration. On the y-axis, and here we measured performance. So F2 displacement, that is how much of the F2 movement that you can observe. And then on the top left plot, we plotted these lines. And these lines are from Nelson 1983. In fact, Nelson, as you will see later, Nelson 1983 was actually the classical paper that gave the basis for a lot of subsequent studies, taking measurement of uh, stiffness, peak velocity, and, and so on. So in that paper, he proposed one way to see if uh, people can approach their articulation or movement limit. So each line here, each hyperbolic line here, is one when you assume a certain amount of effort everywhere, no matter how big the movement is. And you, you plot that out, you get a curve like this one. So if you observe movements that are very close to this curve, it means that the speakers have applied maximum effort all the time. So when I plotted them here, then you can see that these dots are real occurrences of speech, of those syllables. But the syllables are either nonsense syllables, arbitrary syllables, or syllables in sentences. So these are arbitrary syllables, and these are real syllables in real sentences. And so what you can see is that the curves, which I fitted here, all shaped like these ones. Of course, every one of them has a given force. So you, you, whatever you can get is the particular force that you observe. So what is important is that if you have a curve like this one, if all the dots fit along this curve, that would mean that for all these articulation occurrences, the speakers have applied near maximum uh, articulation effort. And that's indeed the case. So that's one thing you can observe. And another thing you can observe already in these plots is that, so for the speech, we use two plots. One, we divide the, the, the tokens into fast and normal. And note that they're not that different. So even when speakers were forced to speak faster in the fast condition, they didn't do, they didn't manage to, uh, to uh, apply greater force. So uh, everything is still uh, along this curve. And also, when we separated stressed versus unstressed syllables, sometimes they are very close to each other, but when they are not close, oftentimes 
it is the unstressed syllables that seems to be produced with greater force. They are more to the left than to the right, whereas the stressed syllables tend to be uh, uh, inquiry, requiring less force. And then if we compare that back to the non-speech condition, these dots that flatten off are the slow conditions where we ask people to say wah, 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 wah. So meaning that once they are, the delivery is slowed down, they no longer increase their force as uh, the duration increases. They basically keep the constant force which makes sense because if you're asked to slow down, you won't say, you won't open your mouth much wider. You won't say, wow, wow, wow. You would still say, wow, wow. So meaning that you have hit your target and you pretty much do that all the time. Okay, that's one way of looking at the data. Uh, okay, this is already evidence that speakers, when they produce segmentals, aspect of speech, they seem to do the same thing as they produce pitch changes. And it turns out that this is not new because a lot of people have reported something similar, although not exactly in the same form. Tiffany in 1980 did an experiment trying to figure out the fastest speech rate that people can do in terms of the number of segments they can produce in a given amount of time. And his conclusion was that in some senses, we normally speak about as fast as we possibly can, at least in the production of full canonical utterances. By that, he means actually when the, all the segments are still there, because he ignored cases where you've, the segments are lost, because then he could not do measurement. So he include, only included cases where can he could still count the segments. In that case, people were already going as fast as possible. So that's one piece of evidence. Another one is a sequence of studies done by uh, Esther, Esther, Esther Youngs uh, in the Netherlands. Her original interest was to see what would be the effect of compressing speech to play it to people who are, say, blind. Uh, how much of the compression uh, can you apply before the intelligibility totally falls apart? So that was her, was her interest. But in this process, she discovered something that is re really interesting. That is, it turns out that you can compress natural speech to a large extent, say 1.2 times or two times, and some people can even do three times. And you can still understand the speech. But when she, when she used natural fast speech as the reference, by the time they could do 1.5 times as faster as in their normal speech, the intelligibility was already down, meaning that people cannot speed up that, mass, that much. Uh, another follow-up study they did, uh, she published with uh, Adank, one of my colleagues, is they reached the conclusion that perception of time compressed speech has much higher recognition rate than natural fast speech. Meaning that natural normal speech has already reached our limit. If you go faster, you, the cost is that you lose intelligibility. You can do it, but you lose intelligibility. So reduced intelligibility at fast speech rate is unlikely due to laziness because they're not lazy at that time or economy of effort, but due to increased level of undershoot. Because if you cannot reach the target because time is too compressed, what do you do? You undershoot the targets. So the answer to question one about the H and H theory is that, um, okay, this is the original question. The answer is no, rather, they do it quite often. It is not the case, as Lindblom claimed, that in normal speech, they're rarely driven, they're, the system is rarely driven to its limit. Instead, it's driven to the limits frequently, although not all the time. And the reason for not all the time, you will see later on, because there are cases where you don't want to go that fast. 
So in normal speech, the production system is often driven to its limits. That is going beyond the limits. Uh, going beyond the limits results in reduced intelligibility. Or maybe this is a point where I can ask a few questions as uh, Anthony suggested that we have some interactions. I think we can continue for the time being. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's fine with me. So let me go on. Now we move on to the second question about the HN chef theory. Um, that is, uh, is articulatory effort the key control of clarity of speech? That is, when you want to speak clearly, do you mainly use enhanced force to do it? And this for this, we are looking at the particular case that I mentioned earlier, that is the stress stiffness enigma. Um, okay, uh, a little more about the hypothesis itself. So Lindblom says that if speech system operates so as to minimize articulatory effort, and he used peak velocity, which goes back to Nelson 1983, we should expect it to undershoot the phonetic target quite often. So he, he agrees that th there is a lot of undershoot, but not necessarily in every single instance. The key point is speakers have a choice, but the choice is that they don't do it when they need to speak clearly. So hyper articulation is a case where you apply extra articulatory effort to make, to enhance phonetic contrast which is more likely to happen in stressed syllables, which makes sense, right? And then in contrast, unstressed syllables are more likely to be hypo-articulated because they are not that important. Um, a, a few words about Nelson's original proposal. So according to him, the measure of effort used in the study was peak velocity of movements which is for the assumed dynamic model is uh, proportional to the force magnitude integrated over the movement time. Here's the key word that people often forget. That is the measured effort is integrated over time. So time has to be included in measuring effort. Now here we can see what it's meant. I, I'm using uh, the trajectories generated by our QTA model. So it's one of the models that simulate articulation using a spring mass model, which is very similar to the task dynamic model and also to a certain extent, the Fujisaki model for intonation. So this is the, uh, the real trajectory. So time versus displacement. So this is the uh, real trajectory and this is its derivative, first derivative this is the velocity. So for a simple movement, going from one height to a targeted height, you get a unimodal curve like that one. So the, what people often do to assess the arbitrary effort, which is measured in terms of stiffness, is to measure the peak velocity and also take the maximum uh, level of movements, amount of movements, and they plot this one to the x axis and they plot the peak velocity at this axis. So very early on, what people discovered is that there's amazing linear relationship between the two. If you do this kind of plotting, that is peak velocity seems to align uh, with displacement, whether it's F1 displacement, or whether it's Articular movements uh, and formant movements, the relationship is very linear. Okay, so within certain limit, the longer the movement duration, the larger the observed movement. So here's what we can see. So if you extend the movement duration as the target goes more and more toward the target, then the movement size becomes larger. So this is what this dimension tells us. But then the, the larger the movement, the faster the speed. So 
within certain limit, if the movement is larger or a movement is longer, the uh, uh, peak velocity is higher. However, what, what you can see now is that if you in extend this movement any further, it won't increase peak velocity because peak velocity here occurred here. So no matter what amount of duration you add to this movement, you're not going to increase this height. But you can increase this height by applying greater force so that this curve will become sharper. So in that case, you can increase the peak here. But as you can already see, that's already showing problems. Because after my explanation, you suddenly realize it doesn't make sense, right? Because the stress syllable here is giving you lower stiffness than the unstress syllable. So this is the unstress syllable and this is stress syllable. And this is generally true as we've reported in the 2020 paper in most cases. And that is the stress stiffness enigma. And this has been reported in many studies. For example, Austri and others, 1983, Kelso, 1985, Austri and Mangholm, 1985, Beckman and Edwards, 1992, and uh, Vaticuatis, uh, Bateson, and Kelso, 1993. But if you read those papers, none of them gave you a clear explanation why this is the case. So this is the puzzle we wanted to uh, solve. Okay, uh, the paper, our paper is 2019. So this is just to give you a few more cases. Uh, so, okay, yeah. So here we are comparing, we're listing, I'm listing the, the three conditions again. So this is a syllable sequence. And this is sentence by speech rate. And this is sentence by stress. You can see is that the stress syllable is behaving more like the slow speed of arbitrary speech, arbitrary syllables. So, and just remember that stress syllables are longer, right? And it seems that longer syllables are behaving more like slow speech. So this is already a hint. Now, what we did further in that study is to try to in, apply the target approximation model to get a better sense of what is really going on. And here we try to use a slightly more sophisticated version of the target approximation model. Uh, the originally proposed was a third order model. It goes to uh, acceleration uh, at most, but this time it's flexible. So we, in the study, we actually went to 15th order. Uh, and of course, in the study, because we're not looking at tones, we assume all the targets are st static. So they're all like this. None of them was like this. So M is always zero in this equation. And then these are the curves generated by the program. And then in the generation, we, gen we used uh, a whole range of duration, whole range of orders, and a whole range of stiffness, because these can be all manipulated in the model process. And here's some displacement curves and corresponding velocity curves. So what you can see here is that this peak occurs here, and this peak occurs here, and this peak occurs here. And from left to right, there's an increase in the order number. And this 14th is almost the highest we applied. And what else can we see? Yeah, so then we plotted out all these variable conditions to generate plots that are similar to the earlier dotted plots, scatter plots that you saw, but which plotted them in curves. So the x-axis is again amplitude of the movement, and the y-axis is the peak velocity. To our biggest surprise, we no longer saw any pure linear relationship between movement amplitude and peak velocity. In all of them, the curves plateau after a while. 
Okay, the only thing is that uh, there seems to be some variability. That is, the higher the order, the greater the linearity. Which means that because when, the, when this kind of model order becomes higher, it becomes more sluggish because it reacts to the force that forces the system to move, uh, to move more slowly. So and that, that, ref, that results in flatter curves, which eventually, although still plateau, but they are more linear than the one with the lower order. Okay, that's one thing. For each function, the most linear portion is well below the peak velocity. So it's not the case there is no linearity, but the most linear part is in the lower bit. So only in this part can you see traces of linearity. And then, uh, therefore, the observed linear peak velocity relation to the movement amplitude is that most of the movements probably occurred here, meaning that they never get a chance to flatten off. They never got a chance to reach the real peak velocity. That's what we're seeing. And this agrees with our earlier observation that when we speak, we're already driving ourselves at the maximum speed possible and resulting, resulting in a lot of undershoot. And so why are the slope? Okay, so one last thing we did is to figure out why the unstressed syllables seems to show greater stiffness than the unstressed syllables. With these two plots, we concluded that it is probably not the case that the stress syllable has less force than unstressed syllables, because that wouldn't make sense. Rather, it is a measurement issue. Because the unstressed syllables are short in general, the most of the measurement we took is from when it's starting to move in the earlier portion. So when you take everything here from early portion, of course you get behavior that is both linear, but for stress syllables, there's a greater chance of getting these points in your measurement. So in other, in other words, it's basically a measurement phenomenon rather than a real reflection of stiffness. Of course, I'm not ruling out entirely that in some cases of stress syllables, we actually have to slow down. Um, yeah, actually have to slow down. So that part, I'm not fully uh, conclusive about whether there is a greater force or, or less force, but at least the phenomenon itself, the, the stiffness stress enigma is basically a measurement phenomenon. Okay, okay, uh, I need to uh, speed up a little bit. So to summarize the obligatory timing, maximum rate of information, and here we bring in the main theme, that is normal speech often reaches human speed limit of articulation. The real tug of war is between phonetic contrast and time pressure, not, and, and this is because we often have to, too much to say, like what I'm doing now. I have too much to say, but I have too little time, so I have to speed up. And uh, the energy expenditure, in contrast, is negligible because I'm not tired, even when I speak fast, as we can easily talk for hours, right? So speech is optimized at the maximum rate of information. Uh, and here we can see that uh, we, this is what we generally do. But if the duration is too long or they need to be long, then we are also bound by our phonetic bound. That is, if you have a, ah, you need to say it like a, ah. you cannot say it like a, ah, because that's a different vowel now. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, the next part is information timing. 
intrinsic timing, in fact, cannot explain all the duration patterns. Despite the intrinsic factors that I mentioned, the obligatory part. So first, intrinsic duration of segments can be ignored, and we often do that. And that would result in undershoot, sometimes massively, and even to the point of losing entire syllables. For example, in the case of syllable contraction, where a syllable is lost and two syllables merge into one. On the other hand, duration itself can carry information which may give segment too much or too little time. And these functions include lexical distinction through length contrast, lexical distinction through stress contrast, focus, grouping, and demarcation. So I only have one slide to show the most of the functions and then spend most of the time on the other final function. Uh, and this understanding is consistent with the Penta model, tar parallel encoding and target approximation model, except that now we are focusing only on the duration dimension. So for functional durational contrasts that people know very well are things like lexical quantity, so languages differ in vowel duration. What's interesting here with this number is that whenever you have a distinction, it seems to be a ratio of two to one or more. And also even for stress, sometimes you use a two to one threshold, close to two to one threshold. But in the case of focus, which I would now consider not to use duration as a major coding factor. You only see small ratios between the long focused one and the non-focused one. But for the real duration used, usually you need that kind of contrast in order to achieve the distinction between the two categories. So in other words, lengthening is often informationally obligatory. If you have to be long, you have to be sufficiently long. Now we are focusing on duration as a grouping correlate, which people study a lot, but they don't link that to other things. And, and this is the link is what I want to do uh, after presenting the basic facts. So in terms of duration, there's a general finding of final lengthening. That is the last syllable of a word or phrase is longer than a non-final syllable. And there is also so-called polysyllabic shortening. If the number of syllables increase in a word or uh, in a word, the word tend to be shortened. And then Nakatani and others argue that the polysyllabic shortening is all coming from uh, the final lengthening. So the uh, polysyllabic shortening from Lehist is shown here. So what she did is to look at words like stick, sticky, sticker, sticking, stickily. And as you go down the list, the duration of the individual syllables becomes shorter and shorter. And she called this polysyllabic shortening. But there's one thing that, uh, uh, that this is probably accidental. All of these words that she used are trochaic, meaning that the stress syllable is the first syllable and all the trailing syllables are the unstressed ones and that gave the study a bias and that is why the polysyllabic shortening was questioned and that can be seen here and this is the pattern reported by Nakatani and others in 1981 and in that study they look this is a very comprehensive study they looked at the relationship between duration and stress, different levels of stress, and also uh, the word length, oh, no, no, position of the syllable in word, position of the syllable in phrases, and position of the syllable, uh, and also monosyllabic utterances. And this is what they demonstrated. They had four speakers, and these are two of them. So here we can see a lot of information. For one thing, it seems that these stress levels, their effects is parallel to word position effect. So whatever the word position, position effect you have, if you add a stress level, 
you just increase the duration overall. This means that there are two functions going on, but they don't interact with each other. And also another thing you may notice, uh, which I'll talk a lot later, is that if a syllable is word medial, it's not much shorter than the word initial syllable. But the word final syllable is much longer. And then phrase final syllable is even longer. And finally, what's very interesting is that the monosyllabic syllables are not much longer than the final syllable that is in a sentence, in an utterance. And this related to this issue. So the, the use of unstressed syllables only in this experiment biased her observation. Now we turn to Mandarin, which we looked at in a similar way. But in this case, we use natural speech, unlike in this condition, in this experiment, they used reiterant speech, just saying ma, 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 ma. And here we just use uh, real speech. And our original purpose is to see the relationship between uh, duration and F0 excursion size. So the first thing we observe that F0 excursion of different of phrases of different sizes result in different patterns in terms of excursion size. But what's most interesting is that these patterns are matched by duration patterns. So in other words, there's a parallel between duration patterns of phrases and excursion size patterns uh, of these patterns. And these here are the uh, sentences. And I was one of the speakers. I'll give you some examples. This is a falling tone, but this is in this is uh, a monosyllabic word. And this is a disyllabic word. And this is a trisyllabic word. And as you can see, it's almost flattened. And this is mostly flattened, but this is weakened. So this corresponds to what you see here. So now the question is, if the two matches, if the two match, which is the source? Is it the duration, the cost, or excursion, the cost that led to the durational differences? So for that, we included another condition where you only have high tones. So the F0 is all flat, you have no movements, but the duration patterns remain, which shows that it's the duration that is the cause of the variability in the excursion size of F0. And it is the pattern is so sensitive that you can see similar things when uh, you have a phrase structure of a, B plus C, D, meaning two, two, which form one word and another word, versus one word followed by a trisyllabic word, and the patterns would react to that internal uh, structure. So this demonstrates how sensitive duration is to the, uh, uh, to the patterning, to the grouping. So this led us to theorize the situation. Uh, that is, it seems that lengthening is used as a tool to mark group boundaries. And there are subtle duration changes, smaller boundaries uh, to help mark relative strength. And this is especially reported and studied by Wagner for his PhD dissertation. And he showed that you can have as many durational differences that mark the relationship uh, up to a level of seven, up to seven levels of contrasts. And our further extension of this observation is that if duration is used to mark boundaries, it's not just the lengthening that can do that job. Pauses also do that. So we can imagine that you can add pause to final lengthening and the two becomes a single factor, which I, I named affinity index. So then you can measure the combined duration of um, final lengthening and the pause. And with that, we 
had a very interesting discovery, which I still don't know how to make sense of. It turns out that Mandarin is very limited in using final lengthening to mark large boundaries, whereas English does that much better because it keeps lengthening it until the last moment, then they have to add silence. So here's the graph. So these solid graphs are, case, uh, are measurements of final lengthening before different boundaries. It turns out that for Mandarin, by B2 break index two, there's no further increase in the final lengthening. And these are measurements that include both lengthening and silent pause afterwards. And you can see that shoots up, meaning that by the time the boundary becomes too large, for Mandarin speakers, they add pauses instead of increasing the final syllable. Whereas in English, they keep increasing the final syllable until the break index is beyond B3, and then they add pauses. So this is an interesting phenomenon that we discovered with the notion of affinity index. Okay, I've reached the one hour, uh, one hour point, but I only have a few more slides. So now I'm going to tackle another big issue that is the rhythm class hypothesis. So many of you are very familiar with this. So it was originally proposed by James Pike or Abercrombie. And the initial version says that there are two classes, stress timed and syllable timed. And of course, later on, people also added uh, more typed, more timed. But I want to first make this clear to us, what it means by proposing that a language is syllable time or stress time. That is, if a language is stress syllable time, all syllables should be equal in duration. And if a language is stress time, the syllable duration can vary, but the duration of each stress group should be identical, right? Because this is what the hypothesis says. It turns out that there is no evidence of that at all when, uh, when phoneticians looked at the data. So this is reported by many people. So by the time of 1990, early 1990s, the whole discussion of rhythm class died down. But then magically it was revived and the re uh, revival started from Roach. Uh, in this paper was basically to, uh, to, to report actually there's no isochrony. But then he made some further observations. That is the stress time languages like English allow complex consonant clusters. So there, there must be higher variation in the duration of consonant clusters. And stress time languages allow vowel reduction. So there must be higher variation in the duration of the vocal vocalic intervals. And that led to the proposal of the so-called rhythm metrics, starting from Ramu in 1999. And they proposed these parameters, delta C, delta V, percent C to percent V. And they led to this finding in cognition in 1999, which is so widely cited by now. And what they discovered is that if you use two of the measurements so that they played with them and they discover these two matter the most, on the x-axis, you can have percentage of vocalic duration in the others. On the y-axis, you have the variability of consonant duration. And if you plot the two, it seems that the stress time languages are clustered here and syllable time languages are clustered here. This is all nice, right? Suddenly there's a revival of the rhythm class hypothesis because they can classify languages in a similar way as the original proposal. But this was met with a lot of criticisms. Uh, I won't elaborate on these. So what we did when we looked at other people's criticisms, because they had no clear proposals on how to 
rescued the theory. So what we did is to see that although there's no isochrony as originally defined, what if there's tendency toward isochrony? That is, if we look at syllables in you know, a syllable time languages, the syllable should tend to have equal duration. And if you look at stress groups or phrases, they should tend to have similar duration. So that's what we uh, looked at. But the data is already there. That is from the Nakatani study and our study. What you can see is that uh, there are two different ways of grouping or grouping related to related duration patterns between Mandarin and English. From this, these two plots in direct comparison, we can already see that Mandarin shows a clear tendency of compressing syllables so that phrases become not, not become tend to become equally equal in duration. And Mandarin has two ways of doing that. One is to um, go from monosyllabic words. Once you go to the disyllabic words, you add one more syllable before it, the second syllable becomes shorter. That doesn't happen in English. So in this case, this is monosyllabic, and this is phrase final, and this is word final. In both cases, the final syllable of a multisyllabic word is not longer, is not shorter than the monosyllabic word. A Mandarin does something else as well. That is, the medial syllable is much shortened in duration, and the English doesn't show that. So in other, in other words, there are two ways Mandarin seems to provide a means of reducing the duration of the phrases in the direction of isochrony of phrases. Now, in searching for the reason for that, we, tend, we turn to another study done by Van Santen and Shi, which was interested in seeing if there's some tendency toward equal syllable duration. And interestingly, they looked at also these two languages, Mandarin and English, American English. So what they did is to uh, first propose a hypothetical straight line that shows no change whatsoever. And then, uh, so relationship between syllable and segment duration with complete partial or uh, no compensation. Um, this one has no compensation and this one has total uh, compensation. But in general, the, uh, if a observed slope is shallower than this no compensation curve, it means that there's a tendency toward equal syllable duration. When the, 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 the variable that changes is the intrinsic duration of individual segments they looked at in the study. So to make a long story short, this is what they discovered. Uh, for English, it turns out that whether you are looking at consonant or a consonant, vowel, or final consonant, there's only a linear relationship between intrinsic duration of segments and the syllable duration that contains that segment. Meaning that English syllables are not compensated for the number of segments within that syllable. And this is in agreement with what we saw before, that there is no flexibility. Whereas for Mandarin, for consonant, you already see a flattening, a slight flattening. And then for vowels, there's a lot more flattening, meaning that Mandarin vowels within the syllable is shortened when there are more vowels in a syllable. And then we did a study ourselves looking at more tokens. And we reported that in 2018. And we basically repeated, replicated their finding that for English, you have linear relationships as indicated by this slope, which is close to one, or sometimes even greater than one. And for Mandarin, 
is much shallower than one. So if we go back to the definition of isochrony, we realize that isochrony at any level requires flexible duration at all lower levels. Syllable timing requires flexible segmental duration because otherwise you cannot compress the syllable. And stress timing requires flexible syllable duration, which in turn also requires flexible segment duration. If you cannot press segments in English, you cannot press the syllable. If you cannot press the syllable, you cannot achieve isochrony of stress groups. So, uh, Segment compensation for equal syllable duration, no in English, yes for Mandarin. Syllable compensation for equal phrase duration, no for English, yes for Mandarin. I would say this is very close to the final nail in the coffin because English cannot be stress time because isochrony of stress group is impossible because, okay, I've used too many glosses, <laughs> because syllable and segment durations are inflexible beyond functional variations. This is important. I'm not saying English duration is not flexible. It is very flexible. But those flexibility are all used up for other things, for group marking, for stress, and for other things. But there's nothing left to do the isochrony bit. So Mandarin, in contrast, a proven syllable time language using the rhythm metrics shows an isochrony tendency toward group timing. Of course, it also shows syllable timing as well. So if English is not a stress time, what is left of the rhythm class hypothesis? That's a big question, right? OK. Uh, I think I'm OK. So then the final question I want to address is also a lingering question for a long, long time. That is. Uh, there's a stress duration confound. We know that contrastive lexical stress often involves duration differences, right? Uh, if you recall uh, D.B. Fry's study that shows English stress has a lot of duration uh, contribution. But stress is also claimed for many cases where no lexical contrast is involved. So even for Mandarin, uh, the full tone syllables are said to also vary in stress. That is in addition to the neutral tone, which is considered to be the unstressed syllable in Mandarin. But there's a lot of cl claims that full tone syllables also vary in stress. And for example, a trisyllabic word are said to have a stress pattern of two, three, one, where one is the heaviest. But of course, if you recall just a moment ago, we saw that this pattern matches this pattern. Right, So this stress pattern fits the duration pattern of trisyllabic words. So is this stress a phrase marking duration pattern? And that is the question. And uh, so if we look back at this model again, the question is, if we have a grouping function that uses duration, or, uh, OK, we have a group grouping function it could use target strength as its marker, or it could use duration as its marker. Um, so is grouping marked by articulatory strength or duration? Given that what we saw earlier, articulatory strength is not higher in stress syllable than in unstressed syllables. Duration seems to be the likely real marker. We use duration to mark, uh, to mark grouping. Of course, this also says that the stress is not there to mark stress because you cannot use yourself to mark yourself. OK, so this brings me to the summary part. In terms of obligatory timing, a real tug of war I hope to have established in speech articulation is between phonetic contrast and time pressure rather than laziness, rather than economy of effort. Time rather than energy is the most precious resource in speech, as I'm experiencing it now, because I'm pressed for time. 
In terms of information timing, duration is used to encode lexical contrast, like stress or quantity. And then this whole uh, bunch of names referring to the same function, um, they're all marked by duration, but not stress for its own sake, because what would be the purpose? So finally, rhythm class is turned on its head. English has no tendency for isochrony of any unit. Mandarin shows tendency of both syllable timing and phrase timing. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much for listening and stop sharing. Okay, thank you, Yi. Uh, for any questions, please click on reactions at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. Or you can type at the chat uh, of Zoom. Yes, <clears throat> Annie, please. Annie? You want it to... Uh... Okay. Okay, so uh, Professor yeah. Botinis, uh, uh, yes, a few words. Well, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, every time I am present at one of your lectures, I enjoy even more and more. I have many questions I don't know where to ask, where to start from. Uh, well, if I take the big, the big picture, uh, this intrinsic and extrinsic, as a student, I believed in these, in those things because I read mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Later, I was wondering, and now I'm very, very skeptical because it may be a myth. Uh, um, actually, no, they're no longer myths. <laughs> oh, okay. Because they're both there. They're both there. Okay, let me argue then. <laughs> First, uh, well, if I remember correctly, uh, um, you named Fowler, uh, <laughs> eight or so, but I think De Cristo and the X group were doing this work in the 70s. In okay if not earlier, they didn't call it intrinsic and electric, mm -hmm. they called it microprosody, microprosody, the, the small differences. In duration? Even duration, yes. Okay. All right. those things, they, are, mm -hmm. they were microprosodic mm -hmm. features, much earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, uh, Fisher Jägerson, Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the thing, the story with the intrinsic is the hypothesis is in the same prosodic and linguistic context, different segmental sounds will have different durations, right? Yes, yes. Good. And the physiological factor because this is that different organs uh, have different structure at different degrees of difficulties of moving fast, yeah. Yeah. which means the, the tongue tip is faster than the tongue roots. Yes, yes. And so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I mean, if we like, 
we can speed up the process of the articulators. Uh, let me no. remind you that <laughs> the fricative consonants, the voice voiceless distinction, the main uh, acoustic correlate is duration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why is so? I mean to say, my position now, it's maybe, I'm not categorical, that even for different segmental sounds, we use duration. Yes. As yes, a correlate. Okay, uh, let me so answer It's your not question. intrinsic, it is on purpose. That's my yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, let me answer your question. What you refer to in this part is part of the public uh, part of the informational duration because that is required to distinguish one sound from another so in that Precisely. case it is required so it is part of the picture i'm not denying that actually i'm 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 including both so both are we, there well we agree yeah yeah i don't deny intrinsic duration but it should be so small in no comparison no, no. Okay, no, 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 they're not small, they're not small, because that's what led to the tonal variability, the contours, led to the undershoot. The, the, the intrinsic duration is huge. They led to all the variability that we see all the time. Okay, let, let me tell you another example. <laughs> if you have the high vowels, right? The, the, the low vowels are much, much longer than the high vowels. Okay, in the low vowels, it is the jaw as well mm -hmm. with yeah. function. Yeah. Okay, it's a heavy articulator. Right. Difficult to move. Okay. Mm -hmm. The high vowels, it is the tip of the tongue for the front vowels and the root of the tongue for the back vowels. In many languages, the high vowels, they have approximately the same duration, although in Greek, the front high vowels tend to be shorter. Okay, but in general, in many languages reported, the high vowels, they have the shortest duration with hardly any difference between them, although in the front vowels we have the tip of the tongue and in the back vowels we have the root of the tongue. We should have longer duration for the back vowels, if we follow the heavy articulation movements. Uh, should I answer the question now? Of course, thank okay. you. My point was that all that is given. In fact, there have been a lot of studies, including Dennis Klaas, his notion of the intrinsic duration of segments. This is all given, but I'm asking a different question. Given all of that, do we approach, first of all, do we approach the limit of producing, the, the, the time limit of producing those sounds? What I established that, that we do, we try to speak as many of them as possible, even in normal speech. That is what's established. This is not refuting at all, all the previous discoveries about duration patterns of different sounds. This is all given, those are all given. So then on top of that, we are asking a different question. Are we trying to speak as fast as possible? And my answer is, yes, we are. And of course, in order to do that, you may have to spend more time on the one that is intrinsically longer. So, or if you're given enough time, the one that requires the intrinsically longer duration got damaged more. So either way, you lose. That's what, that's what happens to fast speech, but we do it all the time. Well, I don't know, uh, Afina, <laughs> yeah, how we, are we... we have some questions in the chat. So okay, yeah. Questions? yeah. yeah. So one is from uh, Shin Xie, I'm, I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, uh, I wonder if any aspects of informational timing is exhibited differently among L2 speakers relative to L1 speakers. I don't know if uh, this person wants to say it. Um. In general, L2 speakers are slower and that is uh, well known, I think. 
<clears throat> okay, uh, another question from uh, Katrina Lee. Uh, when the final lengthening occurs, would the longer duration prevent uh, undershooting? Uh, yes, indeed. So when you have final lengthening, targets are often reached. In fact, there's another thing that we were bothered for a long, long time, that is for tones that are dynamic, when they are in the final position, our model cannot handle the long duration. So because people actually wait before they actually shoot at the target. So they have to wait if the syllable is too long. It's okay for a static target because they can reach it more slowly. For the dynamic target, if they reach the height, the first part too early, they shoot up too high. So speakers actually wait until the last moment before they, they, they articulate the sharp fall or sharp rise. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now have a hand from Irene Vogel. Oh, hi. Um, can yes. you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice yes. to see you. Yeah, lovely. Very interesting. So many interesting points. I have um, a bunch of questions, but I'll try to make it into one, really. Um, so you say that we speak as quickly as we can normally. How do we account for the fact that it's very clear that some people speak much more quickly than others? Um, if Does that mean that different people have different abilities to go faster because of something about them. Um, and that could be possible physiologically, but then there's also this observation, you know, maybe it's not measured, I don't know, but it's certainly intuitive that certain dialects tend to sound, go faster, speakers of certain dialects speak faster than in English, for example, I know this, than speakers of other dialects. And that would mean that it's not exactly related to the individuals, but to whole populations. So I'm just wondering how you see that. Yeah, so the, the, these are actually two aspects to uh, the, the, the timing dimension. Uh, my answer to the first question is definitely yes, although I don't have any data. It is my belief that some speakers still move their articulators faster than others. And if, if that's not convinced enough, uh, if you look at children, very young children, and people who are very old, they slow down. They're much slower than the, the mid-range people. So I'm pretty sure, but as far as I know, there are no formal studies on that. So, which means that we can do a lot of studies on that. For the second question, uh, that's a very interesting one. I, my answer would be that for the languages that are faster in terms of number of syllables they can produce per second, there are certainly factors that allow them to do that. For example, they probably don't have that many clusters. They don't have that many diphthongs because diphthongs are like dynamic tones. They need two movements within one syllable. So for languages that are faster, they probably tend to have fewer diphthongs. And they would be more CV-like. They probably would have less uh, CVCs because in a separate, uh, separate uh, study, we established that for CVCs, the final C has to be sequential from the nuclear vowel, unlike the onset C, which can, co can uh, coincide with the vowel. So these are the factors that determine how fast a, speak, a, a language can be. But I still, I'll, sorry to pursue this, but I will mention that, for example, I give myself as an example, um, it's the same language English, American English, and it's known I mean, people used to say that I speak that fast, but then it turns out that actually I'm just representative of a New York variety. And people say, ah, oh, people from New York speak faster. Same language. And it does seem to be true. So then it's not really the case either that we're dropping the syllables or we're dropping, I don't know, code of confidence or anything. So there, so there must be some learned element as well. For that, I actually have a hypothesis. Okay. And I supervise the student project to, to look at that, but it didn't work. So I still, still don't know. My hypothesis is that that is because American English in general has R's, retroflex R's. A New York dialect happens to not have that. So it's more similar to British English. In, in Britain, people speak so fast, oftentimes you, you can't follow them. 
I think the reason they can speak so fast is that they don't have retroflex R's. Well, I would differ. But this with is you. purely hypo yeah, hypothetical. Hypothetical, because I, I pronounce my R's and go fast. So let's let's <laughs> yes, go. Nice talk, lovely, very. <laughs> Okay, uh, oh, other questions? Have, uh, two, more, two more questions from uh, Wei Zhang. Um, the question is, hi, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, hi, Professor, considering your findings of duration, what role do you think uh, does F0 slope play for Mandarin, Mandarin dynamic tones? Um, I'm not clear about the question. Um, the... Maybe she wants to, to speak? Uh, herself, please, so we can have a conversation, Wei Zhang. So which one is the question? Mm -hmm. Okay, so on the face of it, the, I would say F0 is probably everything about tone. So tone is mainly about pitch. So for Mandarin, uh, F0 is, di is doing the major job. Is that the question? And if we, I elaborate on that. Wei Zhang, is it uh, okay? Okay, we can move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, it's a really great talk. My question is uh, considering the rhyming class in Mandarin, we talk about the there is your data concludes in Mandarin it had tendency for birth, syllable timing, and also phrase timing. Yes. My question are they the same or are they included or excluded? Boom. Because sometimes, yeah, um, yeah, uh, I want to... included or excluded from what are this uh, the timing, two kind of timing, same or included with each other, embedded, for example, yeah, syllable timing and phrase timing. I would say yes, because what I try to establish in some of the slides is basically, if you don't have flexible segment duration, you can't do syllable timing and you can't even do stress timing. So this is yeah. one thing that people haven't even thought about. If you, if you, if uh, English like what Van Santen and Shu established, that the segment duration is inflexible. That's the English simply cannot do stress timing. There's no room for it. Yeah, it's to me, it is completely mentory. Okay, if they can be syllable timing, and then they need it to be, okay, phrase timing. Okay. So this because yeah. syllables can be compressed and they can be stressed. Yeah. Yeah. And we yeah. also showed in with our data how exactly that is done. So, you know, in the trisyllabic world, you have. Uh, the, the the longest, the shortest, yeah, for, and the second yeah, longest. character words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, 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 they show nice patterns. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. The other thing is about, yeah, also about rhyming class. And your data, okay, suggests there is no tendency for English in for any unit. So in your unit in data is syllable or segments, right, or vowels. Um, have you ever... Look at the intonation yeah, phrases, okay, larger phrases. Uh, we have. So the, have. one of these slides show that uh, for uh, the break index is up to B4, and that's pretty large. So we observed already because of that's analysis of Boston radio corpus, the large corpus. And we saw that when the uh, break index is really large, English also use silent pauses but they use lengthening a lot more than Mandarin. And when we first found the data, we were so surprised. Did we get something wrong? That the Mandarin don't, lengthening, uh, don't lengthen word final or phrase final syllable? And then we looked at the data and indeed that was the case. Very interesting. Mm, yes. And also about the um, structures of same sentence structure, the quest statement and questions. For Chinese, you usually have the final particles as ma, okay. It, it, your, your sentences might exclude it, that kind of sentence final particles, okay. 你吃饭, 你吃饭了吗, okay. 
if we have that can encourage the fine sentence final particles, we may find okay the final syllable may not be lengthened. Uh, that could be true. I don't have a firm answer to that question because we haven't looked at uh, the final particle versus no particle condition for duration's sake. We haven't looked at. We actually did one experiment that did include both conditions, but we didn't look at the duration pattern. So just to wanna... make the data neat, okay, we right. have the same patterns without, because the particle, sending the particle is a Mandarin in Chinese. Right. But if Mandarin is more like English in this respect, which I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, as shown by Nakatani and others, the stress level simply parallel whatever pattern that is demanded by the grouping. So, mm -hmm. so that could happen to Mandarin as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Athenia, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Katrina Lee. Um, regarding the fact Mandarin using pauses but not syllable lengthening, can this be explained by the fact that Mandarin is syllable timing and therefore not possible to prolonging the syllables? I dare not answer that question because I don't know. It could be, it could be historical, so I don't know. Okay. We, uh, we thought hard, but we couldn't figure out why. And we have a last question from uh, Xin Xie. Um, do you think timing pressure would affect the production variability within a speaker? For instance, would there be greater token-to-token -to -token variability for the same segmental category when a speaker tends to speak faster versus slower? Or instead, they become more rigid and show small, uh, smaller than uh, within token variability? It's, the it's a big one. It's the last one in the chat room, if it's uh, easier for you to, to read it. I, I, I follow the question. Okay. Uh, I cannot answer that uh, firmly because um, uh, I would say both possibilities, both are possible. So I supervised one PhD dissertation that looked at syllable contraction. So in that case, an entire syllable is lost. But she looked at a range of conditions at which you have different levels of contraction. Uh, one thing she discovered is that certain sounds are contracted slower than other sounds, meaning that when you speak fast, those sounds remain longer. And those are the sounds that has longer intrinsic duration. So, uh, so it is possible that sounds would vary in terms of duration, but it could also be possible, like what Nagatani and others showed, that the, the effect of increasing speech rate is uniform for all the segments. So the longer segments get reduced by the same amount, but because they are originally longer, they get still left a little bit, whereas the ones that are originally short, after a little compression, they're all gone. So I don't know. I don't have firm answer. They don't have clear data on that. You, uh, microphone? Sorry. I'm sorry, I was muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is all. I don't see any other hands or uh, questions in the chat room. Then uh, I think if there is no other question, we may conclude uh, today's meeting. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed, He. Uh, we have joined your lecture. Uh, a big applaud, please. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you all. And I hope you, well, you know, in October we have the conference in Athens. We will uh, talk a lot <laughs> under the trees having our coffee, right? Yes, hope well, so. Let's hope and, so. And uh, in one month, next month, we have another tutorial, and everybody is, is welcome to attend and uh, have a chat together. Uh, e, I had a lot of questions to ask you, very interesting <laughs> things, but okay, 
Thank you very much for today and bye bye. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that I'll send you the uh, PDF of the slides so that the other people may uh, want to uh, okay, have. Okay, perfect. Well, I can know. do that. Of, of course, and we will have we will have your talk right. uploaded right. on a YouTube channel. Right. right. So nothing is going to disappear. <laughs> thank you. Well, and thank bye you bye. very much. Thank yeah. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.